Hello friends, we'd like to welcome all of you to a very special Friday night live program that we're doing right here at the Granite Bay Church. And we have an intriguing title, Pastor Doug, it's called The Devil's Dirty Dozen. Now for those of you who are joining us live, uh, we're in the uh, second week of a new year. And uh, it's always a good time at the beginning of the year, Pastor Doug, to kind of stop and evaluate, maybe look at your own uh, goals. And uh, sometimes people make their New Year's resolutions. Uh, it's good to stop and look at what we believe. And it's mm -hmm. true individually, personally, but it's also true in the life of a church. And so that's some of the things we're going to be talking about this evening. But before we get to all of that, we'd like to welcome those who are joining us. I know we have a number of folks joining us on Facebook, on Pastor Doug Batchelor's Facebook page, and also on the Amazing Facts Facebook page. We're also doing this event live on AFTV. So we want to welcome all of those who are joining us on AFTV as well. And also those who are here in person, we've got a great group that's joined us this evening. And we are delighted that you are here joining us as we're looking at a, a very important topic. But Pastor Doug, before we get to all of that, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together and open up your word and, and look at some important truths. We know that the devil is going to do everything he can to try and deceive, and if possible, even the very elect. And You've warned us of this, Lord, and we pray that we might be firmly grounded in your word. So bless our time this evening, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Doug, the devil's dirty dozen. That's uh, probably getting people's attention. Are they wondering, what is that all about? That's right. Well, we are being a little bit deliberately provocative because it's a very serious subject and some issues we're going to talk about tonight. And uh, maybe Pastor Ross at the beginning, I should mention that if you are tuning in, friends, uh, sometimes your programs are geared more for outreach and evangelism. And then sometimes there's programs that are more in reach and you encourage the church towards revival. This would be in that category. Uh, in fact, I think we have a free offer we're going to make available to anybody that uh, sort of encompasses the theme for tonight. We have a free offer, and it's entitled Compromise and um, Conformity and Courage. And this is our free gift to any of those who are joining us. If you'd like to receive a copy of this book, and it goes along with what we're going to be talking about, you can text the word COURAGE to the number 40544, and we'll send this to you. You'll be able to get a digital download. Or you can call the number 877-232-2871, and ask for offer number 774, and we'll send this to you in the mail. Again, it's called Compromise, Conformity, and Courage, a book written by Pastor Doug, and it deals with a number of the things that we're going to be uh, talking about this evening. That's right. Now, as Pastor Ross mentioned, this is not only the beginning of a new year, but in the Adventist Church, we're in the midst right now of 10 days of prayer, just like uh, before the Holy Spirit was poured out for the apostles, they had those 10 days in the upper room, and there was some repentance that happened there. They'd been arguing who was the greatest and fighting for position, and Peter denied Christ. And, and um, they humbled themselves, and they put away their differences. There was some confession. There was reform. And then came the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we just really believe that if we're serious about wanting revival, then we need to address real issues. Um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not immune to certain cultural forces uh, as all churches, all people are. In fact, I think uh, Pastor Ross has a letter that was written by one of our general conference presidents. I think it was his parting message to the world church. Uh, was it Elder Robert Pearson? That's right. Maybe you read a few words of that and it'll yeah, help Yeah, let understand. me read a little bit of this, so bear with me, but it's, it sets the stage and I think it's very significant. Uh, uh, just to give you a little background, this was uh, Elder Pearson. Um, he passed away in 1989, but uh, this is from a speech that he gave at annual council in 1978. This was actually the final uh, speech that he gave to the leadership of the World Church. It was also the staff of the General Conference as well as the employees of the Review. They were all present. And this is what he had to say. He says, this will be the last time uh, that in my present role I will stand before the world leaders of my church, your church, our church, and I have a few words to leave you with. And then he goes on to say, they say that a movement is often begun by a charismatic leader with tremendous drive and commitment, and that it arises as protest against worldliness and formalism in a church. It is generally embraced by the poor. The rich would lose too much by joining it. 
since it is unpopular, despised, and persecuted by society in general. It has definite beliefs firmly held by zealous members. Each member makes a personal decision to join it and knows what he or she believes. There is little organization, uh, but there is few buildings, but a commitment to the mission. He says the group has strict standards and controls on behavior. Preachers, uh, often without education, arise by an inner compulsion. There is little concern about public relations. And then he goes on to say, and then it passes on to the second generation. With the growth, there comes a need for organization and buildings. As a result of industry and frugality, members become prosperous. As prosperity increases, persecution begins to wane. Children born into the mov movement do not have to make personal decisions to join it. They do not necessarily know what they believe. They do not need to hammer out their own positions. These have been worked out for them. Preachers arise more by selection and by apprentice apprenticeship to other workers than by direct inner compulsion. He said, the third generation organizes, develops institutions, they're established. The need is seen for schools to pass on the faith of the fathers, so colleges are established. Members have to exhort to live up to standards, while at the same time the standards of the membership begins to be lowered. The group becomes lax about disfellowshipping non-practicing members. Missionary zeal cools off. There is more concern over public relations. Leaders study methods of propagating their faith, sometimes employing reward as motivation for service or membership. Youth begin to question why they are different from others, and they begin to intermarry with those not of their faith. He then went on to say, in the fourth generation, there is much machinery. The numbers of administrators increase, while the numbers of workers at the grassroots level becomes proportionately less. Great church councils are held to define doctrine. More schools, universities, and seminars are established. These go on to uh, the world for accreditation and tend to become secularized. There is a re-examination of positions and a modernizing of methods. Attention is given to contemporary culture with an increase in the arts, music, architecture, literature. The movement seeks to become relevant to contemporary society by becoming involved in popular causes. Services tend to become formal. The group enjoys complete acceptance with the world. The movement has become a church. And then he says this, Brothers and sisters, this must never happen to the Seventh-day Adventist church. This will not happen to the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is not just another church, it is God's remnant church. Now, of course, there's more, but don't have time to read all of that. If you'd like, you can look this up and <coughs> read the rest of his speech for yourself. But I think Pastor Doug, he does an excellent job in kind of describing a movement as it moves from the first generation to the next and the next, and how that zeal, that commitment, that sacrifice that you see at the beginning of a movement begins to wane. Today, we find ourselves as Seventh-day Adventists very much in that fourth, fifth generation. And we can see a number of these things that he spoke about beginning to take place, even amongst us, and, and mm -hmm. we need to be careful. Yeah, the, the only thing that can really stop this natural progression of a movement into just being a denomination or organization is the people need to rediscover the passion, the fire of the founders. And... Uh, you know, we name this the Devil's Dirty Dozen because uh, I just have been studying for a few years and watching what's happened to other churches. I like history, and, and I see it, some of those things being replicated in our church. And I thought, you know, sometimes you need to uh, identify something. Uh, before the woman at the well could experience a revival, Jesus had to actually put his finger on something specific in her life. Say, so go call your husband. 
I don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about what mountain we're going to worship on. And, uh, you know, sometimes in the church, I think we need to be specific. And I've identified 12. There's probably more. But 12 high points that I've seen in my years, 35 years now in this conference as a pastor, and uh, that are concerning. And I think that the members need to recognize it in our own lives and in the church and do what they can to push back against these forces. Now, I'm going to quickly read you what these are. Then we're going to back up. We're going to go through them together, and we'll talk about them. And I think that uh, we're inviting those who may have questions on the content tonight that uh, you can comment on the Amazing Facts or Doug Batchelor Facebook page. Pastor Ross is going to get those questions via phone from our studio so we might be able to interact with our viewers a little bit. I'm going to quickly read through what these 12 points are that are sort of high points. The Devil's Dirty Dozen, by the way, the subtitle for the uh, program tonight is Satan's Secret Plan to Undermine the Remnant Church. Number one, no longer believing in the infallibility of God's Word. Two, doubting a literal six-day creation account. Three, denying the divinity of Jesus and personality of the Holy Spirit. Four, doubting, God that, doubting that God can save us from the power of sin. We're not just talking about the, the penalty of sin. We're talking about sanctification. Five, denying the inspiration and authority of the spirit of prophecy. Six, doubting the sanctuary message and the significance of 1844. Seven, rejecting that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. Eight, rejecting biblical principles of modesty and dress and adornment. Nine, rejecting biblical distinctions in the roles of men and women. Ten, replacing reverence in worship with a more casual and charismatic worship styles and music. Eleven, neglecting the health message or downplaying it as legalism. And finally, twelve, laxness in keeping the Sabbath holy, more of a holiday instead of a holy day. Now, I've just seen that in churches that begin to drift and become irrelevant, they often shrink as far as evangelistic growth. You can almost find a lot of these points, maybe not all, but many of these points start to manifest themselves, and it just leads to sort of a downward slide. You'll notice that uh, in Elder Pearson's letter, he talked about that evangelism starts to subside. In the places in the countries where these problems are the most prominent, there's the lowest amount of evangelism. In places where it's still grassroots, the church is exploding. And though it seems like the more administration you get, the more it shrinks. I know it's like I'm, we're preaching ourselves out of a job by saying that, but, uh, but it's true. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but I'm, I'm going to start marching through some of these. And I absolutely. Might as well pass it, Doug. Let's begin at the very beginning. We've got to have a firm foundation, and that, of course, is in the Word of God. Absolutely. I think of the movement of the Adventist church in the early days of the Millerite preaching in the early Adventists. They were known as the people of the book. They always had an answer, thus saith the Lord. They were able to quote from the Scriptures. They knew their Bibles. Yeah, they would go line by line through the Scriptures. Matter of fact, just before we came over tonight, uh, Karen and I were listening to some uh, sermons by an old Adventist evangelist, lived to a hundred, and uh, he was preaching at a hundred. We actually carried him into the Sacramento Central Church at 94 was the last time he preached. I carried him up on the platform, preached an hour and a half, used about 100 scriptures, never opened his Bible, 94 years old. They called him the walking Bible, Byron Spears. And if you ever want to hear this, you can just go to the Amazing Facts website. You can download his stuff for free. Thank you to the family. It's called the Trumpet of the Lord. These people knew the word. <laughs> Karen and I were just listening at home on our way here. And uh, scripture after scripture, long text, not one mistake, all from memory. Uh, people knew how to defend their faith back then. And uh, now sometimes the only Bible people get is once a week, whatever the pastor happens to use, and that might be one or two verses in a whole sermon. Um, the Bible tells us in Psalm 11, verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Um, of course, we know 2 Timothy, chapter 3.16. We all know John 3.16. This is 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And in our presentation tonight, we're also putting in a few uh, quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy that I also think still has authority and relevance. In the book, Great Controversy, the Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as authoritative, infallible revelation of His will. And so one of the problems you see that creeps into the church or any church, they begin to question the absolute uh, authority and infallibility of the Scriptures as a message from God. You know, sometimes a person thinks the devil, I've heard it once illustrated this way, uh, we're expecting the devil to come marching into the church like a uh, herd of elephants just knocking down the pillars of our faith, but he's a little wiser than that. He comes in as a swarm of termites destroying the very foundations upon which our pillars are based. Mm -hmm. And that most important one is how do we understand the Word of God? Amen. Do we believe it's authoritative? Is it relevant for our time? Is it relevant for our culture? These are important things that I think individually we need to, we need to make that firm decision. I'm going to go by the Word. Amen. I heard an evangelist say one time, motor homes don't get termites because they're always on the move. And if you've got a church involved in evangelism, it can often push back on some of these uh, uh, common problems. Now, one more quote, and this is from the book, I'm talking about the Word of God, Acts of the Apostles, page 474. As in the days of the apostles, men tried by tradition and philosophy to destroy the faith in the Scriptures. So today, and if it was true in her day, how much more true is it today? By the pleasing sentiments of higher criticism, evolution, spiritualism, theoph uh, theosophy, pantheism, the enemy of righteousness is seeking to lead the soul into forbidden paths. To many, the Bible is a lamp without oil because they've turned their minds into channels of speculative, speculative belief that bring misunderstanding and confusion. The work of higher criticism in dissecting, conjecturing, reconstructing is destroying the faith in the Bible as a divine revelation. It's robbing God's word of its power to control, uplift, and inspire human lives. Friends, you know, uh, Yale, Oxford, Harvard were established as schools based on the Word to teach ministers. And they began to dissect the Bible to where they got where they didn't really believe it so much anymore. And now you're almost scoffed if you pull out a Bible on those campuses now. Happens little by little. You know, the amazing thing about that is when people begin to question the Word of God, um, not only do they question God's revelation, but they also begin to question the gospel message that's found in the Word of God mm -hmm. that Christ can save, and he can save absolutely. It's, you know, like the quote, if the Son sets you free, he shall be free indeed. Amen. Uh, so if you set aside the Bible, you're setting aside the power of the gospel revealed in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And there's a lack of direction and purpose in people's lives. Yeah. Happens little by little. People say, well, you know, you can't really trust this verse. And that person wasn't 100% inspired. I sat across from a pastor. I won't tell you any more than that. But uh, I was shocked when he said to me, oh, Brother Doug, you know, Paul said a lot of things were just plain wrong. And I saw a commentary from another denomination when Ecclesiastes, when it says the living know nothing, uh, the living know that they'll die, the dead don't know anything. And he said, well, don't pay any attention to that. Solomon was depressed. And, and they started going through little by little and saying, well, you don't, can't really believe that. Or they were too heavily influenced by tradition. That part isn't inspired. As soon as you start picking your Bible apart like that, it's like breaking the glass and just shatters everywhere. We better move on. We've got uh, 11 more to go. Um, one of the other things that we see is a very big problem in our culture today is doubting the literal creation story, in, in particular a six-day creation account. And, uh, you know, more and more we're finding even in the church people are saying, well, you can't totally believe that those six days were literal days that Moses wrote Adam and Eve and, and Noah. That's all an allegory. Tower of Babel, those are allegories. We know from archaeology and science now that can't be trusted. And um, I don't know. It says in the Ten Commandments, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth. And I believe that. And Jesus repeats it. And you know what Jesus said? For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Of course, Moses wrote the first 
He wrote all of Genesis. Those first 11 chapters that people doubt, Jesus said, if you don't believe that, you don't believe me. And so I would contend that um, people that say they're Christians and pastors and evangelists that say, well, we don't take those stories seriously. Well, I hope you don't read Jesus at all because you probably don't believe it and you're just going to abuse it. Well, if you can't believe that God created the earth by his miraculous power, then how can you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? How can you believe that Jesus performed any miracles if somehow God can't perform a miracle and create the earth and create everything that we see? You know, quick answer. I don't want to get too deep in the evolution creation science, uh, but one thing I think is pretty clear. When God made Adam, he was made with a certain amount of age built in. Adam was not created as a baby crawling around. And the trees were not made as little saplings. He made full-grown trees. So when people look in the archaeological record and they see a period of time, God can build that in. People say, oh, well, we know it takes millions of years for the light of stars to get to the earth. What prevents God from creating the stars with a light already in route so people can see it? And so they're just, basically, it's a lack of faith in God's power. That is, uh, and, but this is one of the trademarks you'll see and I'm sad to say I've sat in churches and Sabbath schools in our faith where they scoffed at the well, six-day creation. You know, Pastor Doug, we also see amongst Christians now an idea to try and rationalize uh, the creation account, six literal days, with some kind of theistic evolution where it's not six literal days, but they say there's six long periods of time. And of course, when you do that and it's not six literal days, then what is that to the seventh-day Sabbath? Yeah, it destroys it. A uh, little quote here from Patriarchs and Prophets, and this is page 112. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Bible recognizes no long ages in which the earth was slowly evolved from chaos. Of each successive day of creation, the sacred record declares that it consisted of the evening and the morning like all other days that have followed. These are 24-hour days. They're not ages. And I believe that. I think doubting that is one of the devil's uh, deceptions that we've been talking about. All right. Any thoughts? Or we can go to point number three. I think we're ready for number three. Denying the divinity of Jesus and the personality of the Holy Spirit, and this is seen in in what we sometimes uh, hear is the anti-Trinitarian uh, teachings. And, and you know, I, I've got people that I would respectfully disagree on this subject, and I, I love them, and, and uh, I, I know there have been a number of leaders in the church. Uh, Uriah Smith, I think, had some issues with this. But I think that it's very important to continue believing in uh, the divinity of Christ. Jesus is not created. He's a creator. He says, from everlasting to everlasting, all things that were made were made by him. Uh, he is the eternal God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And you start saying that Jesus was created. He then is not the creator dying for the creation. He is a creation. And it doesn't matter if you use the word begotten or created. If you're saying he did not exist and he was brought into existence, he was created. And so the Bible is very clear that he's from everlasting to everlasting. And also that uh, the Holy Spirit is not an it. Holy Spirit is a him. These are the words of Jesus. I've got a few you'll see here on the screen. Christ said in John 14, 16, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he might abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And there's so many statements like this where Jesus goes out of his way to use all the, the Bible says the Spirit feels, the Spirit guides, the Spirit does everything that we do, but He doesn't have a body like we do. And so uh, I think that's important. And you just jump in if you get any messages for, from our studio where people have questions or comments, and we'll try to fit those in. Let me give you a, a couple of quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy. Book of Evangelism 617. The Holy Spirit has a personality. That's as clear as it can be else he could not bear witness to our spirits with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person, else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. For what man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. And so she was very clear on that. And then there's a statement about Jesus that... Um, 
in Desire of Ages 530, in Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. He that has the Son has life. The divinity of Jesus Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. He's a divine. Christ is not a creature. You know, Pastor Doug, along those same lines, we have somebody that uh, sent in a question. We want to thank you for all of the questions that are coming in. We're getting quite a few. Uh, but this person has to ask the question. He says, what about a uh, new light or new truth that will come in the last days? Uh, will there be new truth? Absolutely. I study all the time, and I hope I'm the one that will discover it. But I don't believe that, uh, I, you know, I always wish I could find Carl's Bad Caverns first, but I'm too late. Um, I, I don't believe any new truth is going to uh, contradict old pillars. Amen. So, um, you know, any new truth is going to be an expansion or an adding to ex of existing uh, principles of truth. Another question that we have related to the Godhead or the Holy Spirit, we notice the significance of the Holy Spirit in the beginning of the uh, Christian church. What about the significance of the Holy Spirit in the last days of the church? Where it talks about the, the latter reign. Uh, is it important for us to understand uh, the Holy Spirit and the Godhead? Absolutely. Well, you know, we need the latter rain. Joel chapter 2, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. It happened in the days of the apostles. Peter quotes from Joel 2 in his sermon, and it's going to happen again, I think, in even a, a grander way just prior to, to the second coming. If Satan's work is going to increase in the last days, do you all believe that? The Bible says where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. I believe God will compensate by pouring out His Spirit in mighty waves on His church at that time. Absolutely. We need the Holy Spirit in a special way. Amen. I think we're ready for our, our next point. Doubting that God can save us from the power mm. of sin. Now, you know, I, I believe in grace. Uh, and as soon as you start talking like this, people think you question the role of grace. But sometimes I think people believe that grace means that God is just going to sort of brush off disobedience. Um, the reason he gives us grace is to obey. But I often hear grace used as it is basically it's like the subtitle for pardon. Uh, I believe in justification. We come to the Lord just like we are. But he not only saves us from the power of sin, the Lord wants to save, or from the presence of sin, not only saves us from the penalty of sin, but he saves us from the power of sin. When he comes, we'll be saved from the presence of sin. And so Christians are not just forgiven. We should be living holy lives. And it should be demonstrated. A um, few verses on that. Um, oh, here's actually a quote from the book, Acts of the Apostles. The Savior overcame to show man how he may overcome. All the temptations of Satan, Christ met with the Word of God. By trusting in God's promises, he received power to obey God's commandments, and the tempter could gain no advantage. Um, it says that, uh, yeah, well, let me see, here's the other. True sanctification, this is Acts of the Apostles, page 565. True sanctification means perfect love, perfect obedience, perfect conformity to the will of God. We're, we completely surrender. Now, I don't believe in perfection, except as we should have the kind of faith that Daniel had when he went to the lion's den and that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had when they went to the fiery furnace where they said, I'd rather die than disobey. God's people are going to need that in the last days when the mark of the beast is out. Agreed? Amen. Yeah, so that's, I, I think we need to be practicing obedience now. And you know, that was one of the early truths of the Advent movement. It was good news that Jesus can save. He can give us victory. Uh, old things are past. Behold, all things can become new. And that's good news. Matter of fact, our question that somebody sent in kind of goes along with this, and it says, how do I know if I will receive the seal of God? Talking about victory. Yeah, well, we're preparing our hearts. It says the 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And if we are following the Lamb wherever He goes now, if we're surrendered, uh, then we're going to be ready to receive the Holy Spirit. You know, if we're empty of self, we will be available for the filling of God. And so I believe we need to come to the place where we say, not I, but Christ, not my will, but his will. Of course, Jesus gives us that beautiful example in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed and said, Father, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Mm -hmm. To have the seal of God is to have that character, that devotion, that commitment, like Daniel and the three worthies, willing to face death, then knowingly deny the Lord. 
And we've got to pray for that kind of faith. Amen. That's the experience that God wants to give us. And especially for our young people that are out there, I know that uh, I frequently get the question, Pastor Doug, am I lost? I'm afraid I wouldn't die for my faith right now. Well, if you're following Jesus in the little tests now, don't worry about what you'll do then. Just be faithful. And if you do fall, don't get discouraged and say, I'll never make it. Get back up again. You look through the Bible, it, the heroes in the Bible often have records of up and ups and downs, but they kept getting up. Absolutely. Maybe, Pastor, I'd just add one more thing. We've been told that the closer we get to Jesus, the more we get to see our, uh, see our need of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we never get to a point where we think, oh, hey, we made it. You know, I'm, I'm perfect. Well, anyone that's walking around saying, I've made it, I'm perfect, well, what does that tell you? <laughs> They're not perfect. It's like the story you told Pastor Doug of the man who got this medal for being the humblest man in town but they had to take it away because they kept wearing it everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I was going to use that illustration <laughs> oh, <sorry>. tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Talking about Nebuchadnezzar's pride. Okay, well, I'll use it again. <laughs> you know, tonight when we came into the program, Pastor Ross thought everything was fine when he left his home, but he sat down under the lights. He said, man, look at all this in my suit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> when the closer you come to Christ, brighter things get. You're going to see more things, and that's actually a sign you're walking towards the light. Amen. So you don't get discouraged by that. Um, are we ready for the mm -hmm. next point? Yeah. Denying the inspiration and authority of the spirit of prophecy. Now, I know if there are people out there listening now, and I'm sure there are, that are not Seventh-day Adventists, they're thinking, oh, you guys are putting the writings of Ellen White on the same par with the Bible. No, we don't. Now, there may be people out there that do that, but uh, it's not approved. There are Lutherans that probably put the writings of Luther above the Bible, and there are Methodists that probably put John Wesley above the Bible, but that's just their problem. Um, Ellen White said, the final authority is the Word of God. Our teaching is the Bible. In the baptismal vows that we've gone over with people thousands of times, it says that the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian. But God still uses the gifts of the Spirit, and He speaks through prophets and prophetess. And in our church, we saw the evidence, biblical uh, trademarks of the gift of prophecy in Ellen White's work, and there's authority to that. Dismissing that, we see, I've often seen, matter of fact, by the way, this list, this dirty dozen, they're not in sequential order of priority necessarily. Uh, I've often noticed one of the first earmarks of a church that is slipping is they're being dismissive of the spirit of prophecy. Pretty soon, they're not a lot different between, uh, it's just the Seventh-day Evangelical pretty soon. And just in my observation, that's what I've seen. Now, of course, Revelation 12, 17. I was just going to mention that. The dragon was enraged with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of his seed, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Testimony of Jesus in Revelation 19, 10 says it's the spirit of prophecy. And one of the gifts that God gives to the church, both at the, you can read about in the early days of the Christian church, the first century, was the gift of prophecy. And we know that before Jesus comes, you're going to have another special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You'd expect the Holy Spirit to give the gifts that he has promised, one of which is the gift of prophecy. And we can see that in the movement, the Advent movement from the very beginning, we can see God leading through the gift of prophecy, through the ministry of Ellen White. Every time God has done something significant in Bible history, he's um, set a prophet in advance whether it's Moses before the Exodus or Jeremiah before the Babylonian captivity, John the Baptist before Jesus' coming, it would seem strange before the climax of the Bible history he had no unique message of a prophet. This is not to add to or take away from Scripture. Scripture is a complete separate uh, sacred volume. But God still gives the gifts of the Spirit. And Jesus said in the last days, watch out for false prophets. He never said there would be no prophets. He said watch out for the false ones, which means somewhere there must be the true ones. And Paul says the gift of prophecy, 1 Corinthians 14, is still a gift in the church long after the resurrection. So um, all, everyone is loath to say somebody's a prophet because you automatically they're suspect because there's so many false prophets. But you know, the Pastor, like Bible just says don't that. despise. The, the, uh, Jehoshaphat said, hear his prophets and prosper. Prosper, yeah. absolutely. And of course you test everything that a so-called prophet uh, has to say by the word of God. I'm reminded of Ellen White's last um, sermon to the General Conference, the World Session, and the story goes that at the end uh, she had finished her, her sermon, her discussion, and she turned to walk back to her seat, and then almost as if she, she remembered something, 
She turned around and she came back to the podium and she had the Bible that she was preaching from. And with a trembling voice, she held the Bible up to the leaders there gathered of the Seventh Avenue Church. And she said, brethren, I commend to you this book. Mm -hmm. And then she repeated it. I commend to you this book. She and wasn't holding up her book. No, she was holding up the Word of God. And um, a true prophet will always point back to the Word of God. Yeah, they, they don't exalt themselves. And uh, if you ever read the step, uh, book Steps to Christ, that's one of the greatest books. Uh, let me read something she said, though, warning us about the last days on this subject. And we're under point number five, denying the inspiration and authority of the spirit of prophecy. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. And, you know, it's, it, it's almost a, a diabolical, the supernatural effort that has gone into the Internet in creating anti-Spirit of Prophecy websites. And I look at the information they've got, and it is just totally bogus. But people are looking for the first time don't know that. And they've been uh, misled, discouraged. Folks come to an evangelistic meeting, and they're just so moved by the teachings, and then they run into one of these websites. And, uh, and it's not always on the websites. Uh, sometimes it's actually members that say, oh, don't worry about that. Don't pay attention to that. And it's a downplay. That's something, an area where I think we need revival. You know, Pastor Doug, let me just uh, interject a question. I think it's an important one. and Maybe it's a good time for us to ask this. Uh, somebody wrote in and asked, what about the backslidden Christian? Is it too late for me? Oh, no, I think, you know, until probation closes, that um, the very fact a person's asking that question seems like the Spirit might be moving on their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit that even brings conviction. And so, you know... Um, the, when the plagues start to fall, probation probably will have closed at that point. But until then, then uh, yeah, I, I believe the Holy Spirit, God is so much more patient than we are. Sometimes we would have given up on ourselves long before and we think, how could God still, after repeat fail, failure over and over again, how could he still have mercy on me? And he's very merciful. You know, for those who might have just joined us along the way, we mentioned this at the beginning, we do have a free offer that we want to encourage folks to take a look at a book entitled Compromise, Conformity, and Courage. And we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. Let me give you the number. I know we're not done yet, but just in case somebody just tuned in, if you'd like to receive the book, you can text the word COURAGE to the number 40544, or you can call 877 232 2871 and ask for offer number 774. Pastor Doug, I believe you can also read this uh, right now online at the Amazing Facts website. Yeah, it's under the uh, free bookstore section, absolutely. Well, we're about halfway done, Pastor Ross. Number six is, um, uh, oh, I already read this one. Uh, uh, number six, doubting the sanctuary message and the significance of 1844. Uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church is rooted in a particular truth of the, the work of Christ, our high priest, in the heavenly sanctuary. This is a biblical truth. I never had problems seeing it in the scripture uh, coming from the outside. All you've got to do is read Hebrews and, and uh, Leviticus and a number of other passages. It always made sense to me. If Christ is giving out rewards before, when he comes, then there's some investigation before he comes. The Bible says, uh, Behold, I come, my reward is with me tells us judgment must begin at the house of God and that Christ is our high priest and that there are different phases in that work. Um, so I, I believe that the, uh, the message of the sanctuary is actually pivotal. Well, you look at the first angel's message and that message that has to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory and the hour of his judgment has come. It's a time-sensitive message. And we find that to be fulfilled based upon Daniel 8, 14, the 2300 days. And of course, uh, this is not something that, that's new. Uh, it's been studied and been examined and been looked at for over 150 years. Uh, we've seen that without a doubt, Jesus is doing a special work of ministry for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation opens with Jesus wearing the high priest's robe, doing a work of ministry. So unless we understand that Jesus is our high priest, he is ministering for us, 
and he wants to do a special work of cleansing and judgment in the church, we're going to miss out on that true blessing that God wants to give us. It's, it's not a fearful message. Sometimes you think of the judgment, oh, that's scary. But in reality, it's Jesus saying, I want to do a special work of cleansing in you mm-hmm. while there's still time. Amen. Because the time comes when Jesus says, he that's holy, let him be holy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Probation closes and it's too late. So it's a message that needs to go to all the world. And Jesus is willing and ready and doing a work of cleansing, a work of judgment. Amen. Yeah. And someday Michael will stand up, Daniel chapter mm-hmm. 12, and time of trouble. When he stands up, that intercession is over. And you mentioned Revelation. Isaiah is in the sanctuary, chapter mm-hmm. 6. Ezekiel's in the sanctuary. Daniel's in the sanctuary. This is a biblical message. And so when people say, oh, you can't find the sanctuary teaching in the Bible, I go, what Bible are they reading? Mm. Uh, so, but some, even in our church, are dismissive. And they say, well, nothing happened in 1844. Oh, yes, it did. The Lord not only started cleansing the sanctuary in heaven in a unique way, there's still a sanctuary on earth, his church. And the birth of the Adventist movement in 1844, he brought together people that believed in the core teachings. They learned the Sabbath truth, truth about salvation by faith, uh, baptism, the literal second coming, so many things that had been lost. Uh, all came together in that body of believers. And uh, that's actually going to lead to another uh, point in a minute. Let me just share this from letter 208, 1906. The correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. And uh, another quote real quick. It is those who by faith follow Jesus in the great work of the atonement who receive the benefits of his mediation in their behalf while those who reject the light which brings to view this work of ministration are not benefited thereby. The Jews who rejected the light given at Christ's first advent and refused to believe on him as Savior of the world could not receive pardon through him. Rejecting this is very dangerous. All right, point number, as a matter of fact, here's some of those quotes I just gave. matter of fact, there's one I left out here. Let all cling to the established truth of the sanctuary, If the theory is that uh, Brother Ballinger, that's um, uh, J. Fox Ballinger, presents were received, he had rejected the sanctuary message, there would lead many to depart from the faith. And some of those same sentiments are being disseminated today. All right. Pastor, let me ask a question before we go to number seven here. Somebody emailed in and kind of goes along with this. It says, can you close your own probation? Well, heaven forbid, if you commit suicide, that would close your probation. But, you know, the Bible says that uh, it's appointed unto man once to die. After that, the judgment. Mm-hmm. So, so um, excuse me? Unpardonable sin. It's, yeah, it's the unpardonable sin at that point. And so, uh, yeah, that would be... Um, I, and you lose all your options, so don't even think about that. But otherwise, don't underestimate God's mercy. But if you continue to, uh, if you continue to resist the conviction of the Holy Spirit... It's like the volume goes down on God's radio where you don't hear it anymore. You lose your capacity to repent. And uh, we've got a book on uh, what is the unpardonable sin that explains that more. Absolutely. All right, shall we go on? Yes. Um, Rejecting that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. Now, I think it's just very important for us to understand that this, the Seventh-day Adventist church, when I first joined, I went to several other denominations before I became an Adventist. And to me, they were that. When I ran into the Seventh-day Adventist teachings, I saw it as a worldwide movement. Uh, I believe that people from all over the world are being called into this movement. It's composed, this last week, our pastors were at a workers' meeting together. There's a guest speaker from another church. And he said, I've never seen a church that was so diverse. He says, you've got people from every stripe and type of society that are here. He said, this is wonderful. And uh, it's like this around the world. Um, it, it's people who are being called out of Babylon. These are the churches that have been mixed up in the false teachings of the Dark Ages are being called back to biblical truth. There is a polarizing in the last days. Everybody will have one of two marks, the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Everyone's going to be shaken into one of two camps. And the idea that we are just a denomination, I don't accept that. And I think that that's one of the hallmarks that's one of the devil's dangerous doctrines that, that uh, we're just, it doesn't matter. All rivers lead to the ocean. It doesn't matter what mm. church you're part of. I, don't, I think that's a mistake. 
You know, Pastor Doug, that's such an important point. The three angels' message, you know, the first one talks about true worship. Second angel says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The third angel talks about false worship and talks about receiving the mark of the beast. Now, what I've noticed, which is interesting, the first angel in Revelation 14 is preaching with a loud voice. Fear God, give him glory. The third angel speaks with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast or his image or receives his mark, it's with a loud voice. But the second angel in Revelation 14 simply says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. I thought it's interesting. The first has a loud voice. The third has a loud voice. The second angel doesn't seem to have that loud of a voice. But then when you go to Revelation 18, it mm -hmm. talks about a fourth angel coming down from heaven. And the earth is illuminated with his glory, and he cries mightily with a strong voice, Amen. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So the message has to be given. Uh, there is a uh, false teaching in the world, spoken of in Revelation as Babylon. And in the last days, God is raising up a remnant people to call people out of religious confusion. Uh, yes, it's not a popular message, but it's a message that needs to be given. Come out of her, my people. When the message is given, then you hear a voice from heaven in Revelation 18, come out of my people. So to downplay that God has a partic particular group of people in these last days is to really take away this fourth angel's message of Revelation chapter 18. Yeah, and if we're being called out of Babylon, they're being called into Amen. his fold. Jesus said, I've got other sheep. They're his sheep. They're his children. They're not of this fold, but they will hear my voice. And there'll be how many folds? one foal and one shepherd. He's calling his people back. He said, all nations will know that you're my uh, disciples by your love for one another. There's going to be a unity. There's going to be a love and a power as he brings people back to his word in the last days. Absolutely. All right, well, um, and I think, yeah, here's, here's a quote from, uh, 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 what is that, GC uh, Bulletin, J uh, July 1, 1900. It's a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. There needs to be a revival, friends. And uh, this is what she's pleading. Even back then, you wonder what those percentages would be today. There's just uh, the world is encroaching on the church and you see this creeping compromise. Now, of course, Pastor Dave, these questions are coming in. We haven't seen them before, but um, I like this one. Maybe you can talk to it just real briefly. It says, what is the investigative judgment in layman's terms? We just spoke about the sanctuary and this investigative judgment. Yeah, well, um, there, there's a judgment in the last days that is going to be happening. In, well, it's begun, actually. We're in the last days now. The church entered this last phase of church history. In Revelation, the seven churches... The last church is called what? Laodicea. Laodicea means a judging of the people. And that's when Christ, in the beginning of that age, which we believe was 1844, that was an interesting year. It was the birth of uh, communism. Uh, Karl Marx wrote his Communist Manifest, The Voyage of the Beagle, The Formation of the Theory of Evolution by Darwin. Just a lot of things happened. You know the first electronic message ever given? 1844 by Samuel Morse. You know what the message was? What hath God wrought? He quoted the Bible. <laughs> First digital message. So that was a very significant year in history. And um, uh, Christ began going through the names of those who have claimed to be his followers, the professed followers, to evaluate if it's genuine. It's not for his benefit because God knows everything. But we're going to be reintroduced to heaven. All these unfallen beings and angels say, you're going to bring them here? And God says, I'm going to show you from the books that they're really transformed. You want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, just to add a little more. Also, we need to recognize that Jesus is not always going to remain in heaven as a high priest. The time comes when he removes his priestly robe and he puts on his kingly robe. And Jesus comes back as king of kings and lord of lords. And there's not going to be a time after Jesus finishes his high priestly ministry for sins to be blotted out, to mm -hmm. be cleansed. Uh, now is the time, as the Bible says, to send our sins beforehand to the judgment. Now is the time to confess. And um, we can't say, well, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow. No, the, the Bible tells us Jesus is coming soon. Now is the time. And for the last 150 plus years, that message has been going out. Jesus is coming soon. Noah preached for 120 years, and, and uh, a lot of people probably thought they might get on the ark. 
But finally, when he made the last appeal, it was just his family that got on board, and the Bible says the door was shut. Life went on outside for seven more days. Uh, but their destiny was sealed. Probation was closed. And that's going to happen again before the second coming. All right. Um, <laughs> all right, here we go. Number eight, you ready? Rejecting biblical principles of modesty and dress and adornment. Boy, you scarcely hear about that anymore. But, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about Christians and their apparel. We are to be holy inside and out. And, boy, if you have the audacity to preach what the Bible says about Christian attire and that there ought to be modesty in, and we should be ar avoiding artificial adornment and not looking like the world, then uh, you'd be called a fanatic. Matter of fact, Ellen White said, you're going to be called a fanatic in the last days if you believe the Bible. Well, Pastor Doug, are Adventists the, the first ones to uh, preach about the importance of modesty and dress for the Christian? You know, if you go back and look at the Protestant teachings... Um, Lutherans, Methodists were uh, the Puritans. Um, you'd think well, that uh, our, our standards were, uh, I'll tell you a quick story. I went to public school in New York City. I went to a lot of schools, but among them I went to public school in New York City. And I remember walking to school with some girls that lived upstairs from us. Public school in New York City, the teacher sent one of those girls home and said, you're not modestly dressed to come to school. And... Uh, Thinking back, no, she wasn't. But what she wore that day would be allowed in most Christian schools. That was a public school in New York. There used to be some standards. And, you know, let me give you some verses here. Uh, you know, the Bible says that uh, in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 22, verse 5, a man shall not put on a woman's garment, neither shall a woman put on a man's garment. For those that do so, it's an abomination to the Lord. There should be a distinction in the dress. Not to mention, it says what? Don't put on uh, First Peter. Yeah, three. don't let your outward adorning be uh, the gold and the silver and the pearls, but rather let it be simple, clean, modest. Mm -hmm. Hidden man of the heart. And so I, I just think that's a sign. If we start looking like the world, we ought to look different. Mm -hmm. I know the, the outward appearance, we don't, are not saved by that. But if there is a change on the inside, it'll start showing on the outside. And beginning to act and look. You know, like Pastor, the world. Like if you ever, I, I know you have, uh, I have too. You, you've met someone, you've never met them before, or maybe just in a public place. But you look at the person and, and you, can, you get the sense by the way they dress that they're a Christian. I was in a restaurant in a town in California years ago with another believer and uh, um, saw somebody there and I just said to him, I think she's a Christian. He said, I thought the same thing. Later that week, I was at the, um, the property title department, and there she was across the counter. I said, can I ask you a personal question? I said, are you a Christian? She said, yes. I talked to her a little more. She's Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> she looked like it. I just, both of us thought that. Right. There was just something different. Oh, one more quick thing on sure. there. In Revelation, you have a description of two women. The one yeah. is described in Revelation 12. As you know, the other is Revelation 17. And without saying which or what their beliefs are and which one has the true belief, just by a description of what they are wearing, you can decide whether this is God's true church or whether this is the counterfeit church, mm -hmm. just by the way they're dressed. They, they never speak except with what they're wearing, and that's how we know from the Bible. Good point. So uh, let me give you a little uh, quote on that I've got here. It says, having before us a picture of the world, the, demor uh, uh, the demoralization upon the point of fashion how dare professed Christians follow in the path of the worldling? Shall we appear to uh, sanction these demoralizing fashions by adopting them? Many do adopt the fashions of the world, but it's because Christ is not formed within them, the hope of glory. Christ, um, luxurious living, extravagant dressing is carried to such an extent as to constitute one of the signs of the last days. There needs to be a modesty. Got a question on those uh, same sure. lines. Important one. Uh, Pastor Doug, how do we show our teens the love of God with so much worldly influence, even in the church? Well, the, they say example, example, mm. example. Uh, you know, the example of every believer and parents in the home, we need to just demonstrate what that looks like. Uh, 
young people will uh, argue with their elders, but they'll never fail to imitate them. Mm -hmm. You know, I think as parents, we shouldn't be afraid to, from time to time, uh, have a pleasant but serious conversation with our kids, especially as they're young, yeah. when they're small, telling them why these things are important. What are the principles, the biblical principles of why we as Christians need to look a little different mm -hmm. than the world. Our priorities are in a different place. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way that it should go. And when he gets old, he won't depart from it. doesn't mean at times they won't question it, mm -hmm. but you're laying a firm foundation when they're young. And that's important for parents, or all pa especially yeah. Christian parents. Train them in the principles. And for love for God, love for your fellow man, you want to follow those things. All right, number nine, rejecting biblical distinctions in the roles of men and women. Take a deep breath. I think most of us have seen the news uh, at the time of this recording, last week, the Methodist Church announced that they're going to be splitting because uh, one contingent in the church was advocating for uh, same-sex marriage and clergy to be able to perform it and clergy being able to be uh, gay or homosexual clergy. And the traditional biblical Methodists said that the Bible doesn't support that. They just could not reconcile those beliefs. They split. That's because they're living in this culture where they're being bombarded by these influences. We are in the same culture. We're being bombarded by the same issues. And I expect as time goes on, we're going to be faced with those same questions. Well, you know, the two institutions that was given before sin ever entered the world, marriage and the Sabbath. What two institutions in particular do we think in the last days the devil is going to try and distort and destroy of course, he's been doing that for the Sabbath for a long time, but it just seems this attack upon marriage, biblical mm -hmm. marriage and the family, it's, it's amazing how quickly this has happened. Y several years ago, uh, there was a, a, a vote that was taken in California, and the question was whether or not uh, to permit gay marriage in California. And uh, I don't know, this maybe eight years ago, maybe more, uh, and the vote was, was no in California. But you ask yourself the question, if that vote was taken today with the impact of the media in our society, uh, how much different the results of that vote would be? Yeah, the majority vote was, the language is very simple, that marriage was to be between one man and one woman. Mm -hmm. And the majority of Californians said, yes. We agree. It passed, but then it was overthrown by the attorney general who later became governor. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the will of the people was not followed. And it's almost like there is a, a radical militant group that is trying to push different values on our culture. And if you believe traditional values, you're called sick. They call it a phobia. But it's actually a biblical value. Yeah. And these, uh, these trends are impacting, yes, even oh, our church. One more thing. Sure. Seeing that we're there, Pastor Doug, we might as well mention this too. <laughs> um, the latest thing isn't just what marriage is, but it, it's gotten to the point now where individuals, even children get to decide whether or not they male or female and uh, that's a frightening thing not only is it undermining the biblical model of what marriage is, is it's even undermining that God created them male and female and it undermines parental authority yes it's if parents should dare to say to the children uh, all you've got to do is check your chromosomes in your mirror to know what you are the state will call it abuse and they can even take the children away mm -hmm. And that's why I said it's just, it's actually gone to ex insane lengths. And for those who are watching, some are watching on AFTV right now, we'd just like to remind you that uh, we do have the freedom to maybe go a little over. Whenever we're done, we'll resume our, our normal programming. Of course, that won't matter on our Facebook pages. All right, I think we're ready for the next one. Okay, uh, well, let me see here. I was going to, no, I better not read that. <laughs> 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 Number uh, well, I already read this one. He made them male and mm -hmm. female, Genesis 127. In the image of God, he created them. This is part of his plan, that they're separate. And I read Deuteronomy 22, that God even said it's an abomination for men to dress like women or women to dress like men. I, don't get mad at me. Go take it up with the Lord and with Moses. Uh, this is what the Bible says. If we're going to be Bible Christians, it's what the Bible says. Amen. And he wants those distinctions to be so clear and so manifest that he doesn't even want us being vague in our clothing. Mm. But whew, fashions today, so you have to take a double take all the time to figure out what somebody is. Is it just me? <laughs> Number 10, replacing reverence and worship with more casual and charismatic worship styles and music. 
And I'll confess, these are my wording. I'm sure they're not perfect wording. I was trying to find out how do you put in words uh, that there's, it seems like there's a dramatic shift in worship styles. And, and I want to preface anything I say. I, I, I think we should sing new songs. Do you know every song you sing was once a new song? Had you thought about that? A and uh, I, I don't think we should be afraid of even doing new things. Obviously, in our church, we're using new technology to spread the gospel, but you don't want to lose biblical principles of sanctity and reverence and worship. Uh, there in Isaiah, the angels around God say, holy, holy, holy. And um, before I ever became an Adventist Christian, I, like I said, I worship with Charismatics and Pentecostals, and boy, I tell you, I saw everything. But it just, something told me inside, I can't picture Jesus being part of this. And, um, but now, uh, you can see some of the worship styles, which to me, harken back to pagan worship, are infiltrating Christianity and yes, even our church. And I think that's a concern. You know, when God appeared on Mount Sinai to give the Ten Commandments, uh, the Bible describes how there was the fire and the cloud and God gave instructions to Moses to tell the children of Israel that they were to put a perimeter around the mountain and that the people weren't to come up onto that mountain or cross over that boundary. God was illustrating his glory and his power and his holiness. And even though now we come to God, he is our father, he loves us, he wants us to come to him, there still needs to be a reverence and a holiness when we enter into the presence of God. Uh, you know, when somebody prays and they are filled with the Spirit and there's power in their prayer and there's heartfelt, genuine worship, it's a humbling, sober experience. When Jesus prayed, mm -hmm. and the disciples heard Jesus pray, there was, there was such a power that they came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Mm -hmm. Show us how to pray. There, there is that special reverence and that holiness that we don't want to lose sight of in the last days. Yeah, the, the awesomeness of God. And you can go in back to the story you just mentioned there in Exodus 32. The children of Israel, while God's giving Moses the Ten Commandments, they make a golden calf. And Joshua must be somewhere halfway up the mountain because he's not with Moses. He's not with a crowd. Moses comes down to meet him, and Joshua says, we better hurry. There's a sound of war in the camp. Their worship service started sounding like war. And Moses said, no, that's not the sound of those being overcome or those who are shouting for victory. It's the voice of them that sing. It, it had turned into a party. But it sounded like war. But it was called their worship service because they were modeling it after the pagans. Let me read something to you from the book Maranatha. And this is page 234. The things that you've described, the Lord has shown me, would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. Speaking about in the worship service, they'll be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this will be called the moving of the Holy Spirit. I've already seen that other places, but uh, I think I've actually seen it uh, in, in our own sisterhood of churches. And that's why I just, it's a great concern. We need to pray that uh, we get back to the, the uh, biblical pattern. Any thoughts? Oh, we better You're going to steer clear of that one, huh? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number 11. Oh, and this is that quote I just gave you from Maranatha. Um, let me see here. Neglecting the health message or downplaying it is legalism. I, I've just, uh, I've observed that sometimes it, it seems like you go years in an Adventist church without hearing a good sermon on what the Bible says about health. And uh, I'm not just talking about, you know, trying not to have too much sugar or cholesterol in your diet. I'm talking about the, the real health message that, you know, encouraging a vegetarian diet. And, uh, oh, I think that uh, PBS did a program on Seventh-day Adventists and they came up with the figures that 30% of Adventists follow a vegetarian diet. And I think there was an internal research, and they said 40%. Now, that could be because somewhere in America and somewhere overseas and they, in Pacific Islands, they may eat more fish. I'm not sure why there's a distinction. But in spite of that, Seventh-day Adventists live so much longer. And I thought, well, what if 100% uh, of us followed the health message? Wouldn't that shock the world? We were living 20 years longer than everybody else. And, uh, but 
I sometimes go into church gatherings and they joke and mock those who are going to eat their beans and, who are, and, and they'll mock the vegans and they'll mock the vegetarians and, and that's not a good trend because I, I, I think it's a matter of life and death. It breaks my heart when I see people shopping cart in certain stores and I think these folks are cutting their life short. It really is a matter of life and death. You know, some people might say, well, what does that have to do with your spiritual life? I mean, does it really matter what you eat? Well, if you stop and think about it, God speaks to us through our mind. Uh, the Holy Spirit guides us. In order for us to understand the Word of God, we want to have a clear mind. And what we put into our body affects not only the body, but it also accept affects the mind. So does diet, lifestyle have to do with our spiritual life? Absolutely. You know why we're all in trouble today? Somebody ate something they weren't supposed to eat. <laughs> the book of Daniel is a book of prophecy, greatest prophecies. It starts out with the boys deciding we're not going to defile ourselves with Babylonian food. And I think if you're going to see a revival in the last days of God's people, we need to start trying to get back to the garden and eating like we plan on eating in heaven. And uh, let me just read a couple of quotes on uh, that theme. Vegetables, fruits, and grains should compose our diet. Not an ounce of flesh meat should enter our stomachs. The eating of flesh is unnatural. Our human bodies aren't designed for it, for one thing. We're to return to God's original purpose in the creation of man. And that's from uh, Council on Food 380. And again, same book, 381. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord. Take a deep breath. Brace yourself. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away with. Flesh will cease to be part of their diet. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily towards it. I cannot think that in the practice of flesh eating we are in harmony with the light that God has been pleased to give us. You know, if we believe that we're a people that are soon going to be eating from the tree of life, uh, especially even in the world, people are recognizing the benefits. How much more should the church be Champ champions of this truth. And Jesus said that if we don't stand for it, the rocks will cry out. And that's what's happening. Others are picking it up. Well, the Bible says, no, you're not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And again, the Bible tells us whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. That's not just meaning say a prayer before you eat. <laughs> it means by what you eat, by what you do, how you live. Yeah. We can do it to the glory of God. Amen. And just jump in if you have any last uh, comments from the people online that are they're watching. Um, we'll go then on to uh, number 12. This is the end of the devil's dirty dozen. And I want to just remind you that these, uh, these are issues that um, the devil uses, he's used for years, same uh, thing, to undermine revival movements. Laxness in keeping the Sabbath holy becomes a holiday instead of a holy day. Mm. Now, I remember talking to a lot of friends when I first became a Christian. They weren't Seventh-day Adventists, and they talked about how their ancestors were so particular about Sunday keeping mm. that they, they kept, if you go back 80 years into the typical Methodist, Baptist, even Presbyterian churches, they kept Sunday better than some Adventists are keeping Sabbath, and it's in our name. And uh, they said, we had a certain set of clothes that we only wore on that day. And uh, they said, we were in church from sunrise to sunset on that day. Our parents never had us play. We had, and they talked about it. Yeah, I'm not suggesting this. They said it was like torture. We had to sit on wooden benches all day long. But you, you just see the compromise. And now, I, I used to preach in Sunday churches. And I remember I was in this, this one uh, church I won't name. And at the door, on my way in, one of the deacons said, you better be done by 12 because the football game starts. A and just the, you know, the atmosphere in those churches, do we think that those worldly attitudes are not going to affect us? It's already affecting us. Uh, this is supposed to be holy time. And when people say, you know, after church, let's all go out and buy something to eat. Uh, folks go into the mall. Hmm. Uh, and I just think that the sense of holiness is being lost. You know, one of the things related to the Sabbath that I think we want to keep in mind, and it's easy to happy, but, uh, happen, but we've been counseled to guard the beginning and the ending of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we're so busy with things, we look up, oh, the sun's already set, the Sabbath is always here. But I think especially when we have kids in the family, when we have families, uh, even just married couples, to, to make something special 
about the opening of Sabbath. I remember growing up, I grew up in an Adventist home, pastor's home. And one of the highlights in growing up as a kid, we always looked forward to Friday evening. Uh, it was just our family. We'd get together. Uh, Mom would always make something real special for the meal on Friday night. We had our Friday evening meal that she'd prepare. And there was always an opportunity for us as a family to come together to open up the Sabbath, to sing a few songs, and to kind of catch up on what the Lord has done for us that week. Mm. And some of my best memories growing up was opening Friday evening Sabbath. And the Sabbath is to be a blessing. Amen. And, and we should look forward to the Sabbath, and especially our children. Make it special. Not only the opening of the Sabbath, but even the closing of the Sabbath. One other quick thing. We even had at times... Um, special bed covers for the Sabbath. And as a kid, I remember we'd have our Sabbath sheets. It was a big deal. Friday evening, we get to get the new sheets put on for Sabbath. Make it special, especially for children, grandchildren. It's an important thing. Yeah, that's why they call Friday the preparation day is you, you get to work get hard ready. and make it special that's right. for that day. You know, there's a quote here from my testimonies. I think I have it on the screen. Far more sacredness is attached to the Sabbath than is given by many professed Sabbath keepers. The Lord has been greatly dishonored by those who have not kept the Sabbath according to the commandment, either in letter or the spirit. So it's also an attitude. He calls for a reform in the observance of the Sabbath. It's meant to be a blessing. And if we're going to go to the world and teach this and invite them to be part of our church, this is a distinctive doctrine, uh, an area where I think we need a revival to show the beauty of it, and that it is attractive, and it is, it is a blessing. Well, there, <laughs> there you got the devil's dirty dozen. Uh, I just see these are areas where I think that the enemy is trying to undermine our faith. Mm -hmm. And here we are, the beginning of a new year. Uh, when we're praying during these 10 days of prayer, this will give you something to sp specifically pray for, that there could be revival. And maybe in your lives, and those who are watching or listening, say, we want to make some, some changes. You know, uh, I'll share a little illustration in closing. Um, I heard about a pastor that was uh, flying on a long flight one night, and, and a after they took off, uh, it wasn't long before the plane began to bounce a little bit, and, you know, they've got different levels of turbulence, and you've got light and moderate, and then you've got serious, and you've got extreme. And at first it was a little light, and then it got moderate, and the pilot came on the air. He said, folks, we apologize for the rough air. He said, we're not going to be able to offer the, uh, the, the drink service until it settles down. A little while later, he came back on. He says, folks, I am really sorry, but we've got some serious weather ahead of us. We're not going to be able to do the meal service. And then the pastor was looking out the window, and he saw the clouds starting to flash, and the plane began to bounce violently like a cork in a hurricane. And uh, everyone's kind of shouting with every lurch, and and uh, people are counting their rosary beads and they're crossing themselves and praying and you can hear them hooting and, and uh, gasps. And pastor, uh, he looked over across the aisle and he saw a little girl was sitting and she was in a seat by herself and she was coloring. And every now and then she'd listen to people shout and hoot and she'd look back down. She kept coloring and changing crayons and she didn't look the least bit worried and he was absolutely amazed by that. And uh, finally, the plane survived, and as it landed, he thought to myself, I've got to find out what her secret is. So as they were getting off the plane, he got in the line, the aisle behind her, and he said, you mind my asking? I saw when we went through that very rough weather back there, you didn't look the least bit concerned. She said, oh, no, my dad's the pilot, and I know he's just taking me home. <laughs> and, you know, friends, I think we're going to see some turbulence ahead, but that doesn't mean we need to be worried because... God is not worried, and we know who the pilot is, and uh, he's going to get us through to the other side. You know, there's a verse I'd like to close with. Maybe, Pastor Ross, you want to read this familiar passage? Absolutely. This comes from Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. This is a good time for God's people to humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. And the promise is he'll bless them. He'll forgive us. He'll heal our land. And what we want is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Uh, before we close with prayer, you might mention those who've joined us a little late. We do have a free offer. Our free offer is a book entitled Compromise, Conformity, and Courage. And we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. 
The number is 877-232-281 and ask for offer number 774. Or you can just text the word COURAGE to the number 40544. We'll be happy to send you the book. And again, you can read this for free online just by going to the Amazing Facts website as well. You know, Pastor Doug, I'm reminded of one statement that uh, we've all heard before, but it's an encouraging statement. Mm -hmm. We have nothing to fear for the future except that we forget how the Lord has led us and our teachings in the past. Amen. That's a good point. And, you know, as we close the program, uh, we hope wherever you are, friends, if you're with a group that's watching or in your family, that you'll take a moment right now, kneel down and pray and ask God to help you experience a new beginning. We're still in the infancy of a new year. 2020, new decade, and it's a great opportunity for us to have revival. But we have to be honest about what some of the issues are. We don't want the devil to, uh, it's, uh, who was it, Peter said, we're not ignorant of his devices. And so we just wanted to be aware of what some of these inroads are and pray specifically that we could have revival in our lives. Oh, you know, Pastor Doug, before mm -hmm. we pray, um, is there a possibility that if folks want to take a look at these 12 points, and maybe some of the quotes that you mentioned, is there a possibility that you can maybe put this on your Facebook or a link to your notes? We could, and I expect that the whole program will be archived, but maybe what we ought to do is in the statement where we archive it, we'll just put down these 12. And again, this is not scripture. This is just Pastor Doug's unofficial, some of the things I've observed as I travel that are a concern, and I th just think people need to be aware uh, that the devil's trying to make us another statistic as a denomination. I don't, I don't think God wants us to be another Amen. statistic of a revival movement that just became irrelevant through compromise. Amen. Well, we want to thank those who are joining us on Facebook and on uh, AFTV. I want to thank you for being a part of our discussion this evening. We'd also like to thank uh, the many of you who have come out to join us this evening. Uh, it's always nice to have uh, real people in person that you're talking to versus just those joining us online and around the I world. I want to thank our media volunteers Absolutely. and crew that set all this up with very short notice. Sometimes Pastor Ross and I get a bright idea and we just make a decision and then we tell them and uh, we want to thank them for all that they've done to yeah, Absolutely. Would you maybe take us off the air praying Absolutely. for us tonight and um, uh, that, that God will bless and bring revival. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to take a few moments today and just look at those wonderful foundational truths that are so important. Uh, Lord, we are grateful for all of the wonderful messages that you have given to us as your remnant people, uh, precious truths that throughout history people have been willing to die for the truth of your word and for standing up for these uh, important biblical truths. Father, we know that in the last days the devil is going to do everything he can to try and distract us from keeping the main thing the main thing. And Lord, we just pray for your grace. We thank you that uh, we do have a, a high priest, a savior ministering for us. And Lord, may we take full advantage of all of the grace and the goodness that you want to give to those who turn to you. Father, we thank you for our church. We can indeed see a remnant movement that you have raised up and we want to pray for the church. We know uh, this year is a general conference year, and we want to ask your Holy Spirit in a special way to lead us. Uh, we have uh, leaders that are chosen that you would continue to keep your hand over this remnant church, this movement. Keep us faithful to you, and individually, Lord, as uh, Christians. Mm. May we also be faithful in our lives, in our families. Thank you for being with us this evening. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. God bless. Good evening, and we hope we see you all tomorrow morning as well. Happy Sabbath.